Hello and good evening, folks. Thanks for coming out on what is a pretty grim night. Um, I will start with this slide. And this slide is uh, it's shown at every talk that I do. And the idea is to persuade you to get money out of that wallet, that pocket, whatever it is, and stick it in that hat halfway through. And if this talk doesn't inspire you to do that, then no talk ever will. Why do I want to do that? Because saving seabirds is one of my great passions uh, in life. Um, some of you will remember Save the Albatross. Do you remember Save the Albatross? And you wonder whatever happened to that. Well, was it successful? Well, it's been remarkably successful. That does not mean to say there is not a million miles to go. But people often wonder, what is the point of putting good money after bad, because nothing's changing. But this is something where things have changed and are changing for the better. Tonight's talk will seem grim at times, but there's always the little light at the end of the tunnel, and most of you are that light. Okay, so at times, it's gonna be a hard listen. At times, you might feel a bit downhearted, but I'm hoping that I can leave you with at least a little bit of encouragement and hope. Because I still live with hope, despite everything that I see. I'm an ecologist. I don't know if you know this, but ecologists as a group are the unhappiest people on the planet. <laughs> They're most depressed. Okay? And still I smile and I try to move forward. And tonight's talk, well, do you know what? Nature needs you, and it needs you more than it ever has, ever, at any stage in the past. Some of you will know the situation because you've kept across the news for many years now, and you know, and this was back in 2018, this headline, we have 12 years to limit climate change and catastrophe, warned the UN. What has changed in four years? Not a lot, except hope still springs eternal because the younger generation are not going to put up with the mess that we're going to leave them. All right. They have activated to the extent that they are putting real pressure on governments, on people in power who want to do anything but take the right steps to protect our planet into the future because they're all about short-term gain. Money. Money. Power is corrupting our potential to change things for the better. But I would tell you now that this man thought he was the most powerful person on the planet. But Greta, for me has more power in her little finger. Oh, he's got very little fingers, hasn't he? Uh, in her little finger than that man could ever possess because she has the power of reason, the power of logic and the power of science behind what she is saying. Even this week at COP27, very much by and large, they copped out again. They still haven't committed to it full scale, we are going to miss the 1.5 degree target and we've already seen what is coming down the track. Anybody that's been to uh, the polar regions, to the uh, Greenland area, anything like that in the recent past will know that the ice caps are melting faster and faster and faster. So action will need to be taken. I'm not gonna dwell on this too much at this stage. But I'm going to take you back in time to a point of time when I can remember when I could hear insects buzzing in the meadows. Okay? And I'm going to start with this question. Where have all the insects gone? Now, as part of my research for this talk, I went on the internet. Has anybody heard of this miraculous piece of technology. Because they say you go onto the internet, you can find anything 
at all. Oh, any information you like. And I thought, well, what I need is a photograph of the meadow, of a meadow in the 1970s, when I could hear those insects in the meadow. And guess what? I can't find a single photograph on the internet of a meadow from the 1970s, because I didn't know I was going to do this talk when I was six years old or seven years old or whatever. This is the only photograph on the internet that comes up when you type in Meadow 1970s, <laughs> which is a group called Meadow, which actually featured Laura Branigan, funnily enough. But there you go, by the way. So I got the next best thing. I thought, oh, what do I remember when I used to travel around the country with my dad, you know, when we were going to Scotland in the caravan and whatever. What do I remember vividly from that period of time? Yeah. And I remember splattered insects all over the windscreen of the car. All over the windscreen. And then I started to realise over time that the number of splats was definitely decreasing. And it really struck me a number of years ago. I came back from doing a cruise tour where I speak on these ships. And I got into my car in, in Plymouth. And I drove all the way to Warrington on what was one of the hottest days of summer. All that way. I had three insect splats on my window from hundreds of miles of travel. I would have had to get out of my car and wash the windscreens down back in the 1970s to make sure I could actually see the traffic because that's how many insects were around in those days. Uh, some of you may have even taken part in citizen science projects like the splat test uh, to see if this decline is real. Or maybe, maybe there's hyper-intelligent insects that just avoid the roads now. Who knows? Uh, it could be that. I mean, it seems unlikely to me. So is the decline real? And if so, what are the causes? Well, I mean, the, the problem we always have uh, when you're trying to persuade people that change needs to take place, that things are happening for the negative, is they need evidence, don't they? Uh, of course, they might come back with a retort that say we're sick of experts or something like that, but you know, we have to bypass them at some point. Um, so we've come up with a, some technology, we come up with some traps called Rothamsted traps and suction traps, and we've dotted them all over the UK. It's not me that's done it. it you know, it's the Rothamsted Insect Survey Group. So we've got like, suction machines and things like that, and light traps. And, and they've been operating now for, the, whoa, I'm looking for, what, 1933, the records go back to, and there's about 80 sites in the UK where this is going on. The, net, the network's been in full operation since 68, so since before, really, I was really observing the insects in detail. But even as a child, I could tell you that there were way, way more insects. And why do I know that? Because I would go along the roads and tracks near where I lived, and there would be all these hairy caterpillars wandering across the road in midsummer. I can go to those same roads now. Do I see those caterpillars wandering across the road? No, I do not. So it tells me that those, at least those ones, those moths, like the garden tiger, have dramatically declined. But you don't have to be a moth trapper to know that this is going on, that these declines are for real, which is something in the order of 40, 50 percent minimum. Because I don't, most of you have got a lawn, have you? Put your hands up if you've got a lawn. How many of you let it grow a little bit every now and again? All right, so a good proportion of you. So when you come to mow it in late summer, you disturb this character. It's called the yellow underwing moth. And it's that moth that you disturb that flutters off very fast and just flashes yellow. Has anybody ever seen that? Okay. So here's a story. I started moth trapping back in the early 1990s, properly moth trapping in the early 1990s, in my garden in Widnes. I'm, I'm now living in Stockport, but I used to go out and do surveys all over the place with my moth trap. On a good night, on a really good night, in the summer, at the peak of their flight, I could easily catch 300 large yellow underwings in my moth trap overnight. I could put the same trap out in midsummer this year, and if I caught 30, one of the commonest moths in Britain, if I caught 30, that's a good night now. That's like, well, that's as good as it gets. So that, put that in perspective, that's the decline of one of our commonest moths. So these declines we know from all of this scientists scientific work and the efforts of people uh, who are moth trappers up and down the country. We know that this 40% decline within 40 years 
Um, you know, it's going to continue because the driving factors are still there. It's not just moths, it, it's beetles. It's pretty much everything is impacted by what we are doing. There's a lot of things that we're doing. Climate change has some uh, impact on it, but it's really generally not climate change that's, that's driving these very rapid declines. So you can see an overall decline in 32% of macro moths. We've got 2,800 species of moth in the UK, but only 800 of them are macro moths. The other 2,000 are micro moths. Uh, the things uh, that include things like clothes moth, funnily enough, which are now really rare. Do you know where the best place to find a clothes moth is now? Barn owl pellets. That's the best place to find them now. Anyway, by the by, we do still have meadows. We don't have as many as we had by any stretch of imagination, but they can still be full of insects if they're in the sort of right place with, you know, where they've not had pesticides and herbicides and all that kind of stuff. And I can tell you this for true because, you know, and I thought, I thought I'd gone deaf. I genuinely thought, have I actually just lost that bit of my hearing? But then I went to the Peacocks to Europa. I went to the top of these beautiful meadows in the Peacocks to Europa where they don't use pesticides, where they don't use fertilizers, where they don't use herbicides. And I go into these meadows and the noises of insect life were a buzz, quite literally. And I went, no idea, I haven't gone deaf. They're just, they're not there. They're not there anymore. So you go to places like this, and it kind of looks okay. But even places that look okay have still had significant declines. Just to give you some uh, information, we've lost 97% of our meadows since the turn of the 19th, 20th century. In Cheshire... I think you lot still think you're in Cheshire, is that right? Uh, I thought so. Uh, in Cheshire, as a lad who lived in Lancashire and suddenly found himself in Cheshire, that was a bit much really, wasn't it? You know, when, it got, when the uh, 1974 agreement came out. Anyway, by the way, 97% is what it is. In Cheshire, we've lost 99% of our... They're not unmanaged, but they're unimproved grasslands. That's the best way to think of it where grasslands that aren't hammered with pesticides and herbicides and the like. So, we've only got a fraction left, and that's part of the problem. Because if you've only got a fraction left, then you have an exponentially greater loss. I'd like to put this in context. So, so imagine, I want you to imagine that all of the uh, available land in Cheshire for wildlife is this table. All right? If it's that table, it can support a thousand species. But then imagine the whole room is Cheshire's available, available land for wildlife. And suddenly you can support 30,000 species. Because big is best. Bigness, you need bigness in nature. Putting it into smaller and smaller parcels and compartments is just driving down biodiversity. Are pollinators declining? Yes, of course they are. Of course they are because of a consequence of loss of habitat and the increased use of pesticides. And also what I would consider to be thoughtless, needless mowing and destruction of habitats when it really, really doesn't have to happen. It just doesn't. And some of you may say, well, no, they've got to keep it looking neat and tidy. Well, neat and tidy is pretty darn poor. For biodiversity, what nature needs is complexity and a little bit of sort of nooks and crannies and holes and niches. That's what nature needs. You don't need a billiard table. And every time the bees get used to where these little flowers are starting, it's like, we come along and mow them out again. And it gets worse than that. I mean, you can see that some areas are for, for recreation, fine, you want them short mowed. But why are they mowing in the middle of summer a bank? that cannot be used, this is local authorities, well, they're some of the worst culprits. I have worked for them for 21 years. What are, they, what are they mowing that bank for in the middle of summer? I'll explain to you why. Because a huge number of people in this country have become conditioned to the idea that if it doesn't look tidy, 
then it's not being managed. It's not being cared for. It's not important. And in fact, it's a mess and is bringing the neighbourhood down. We have to change that. This group of residents in Poole were complaining about the long grass, about it being a mess, and campaigned successfully to get the council to cut the grass. Do you know what came along in 2019 and 20? COVID. Did anybody notice how much more grass was left unmowed? <laughs> Wildlife must have gone, woohoo! Before long, we'd have had those great um, goats coming down the highways. <laughs> Who knows what would have happened? But here's the reason why so much has been lost. The amount of pesticide, the amount of herbicide that we are putting onto the landscape around us is eye-wateringly high. It's, it, I mean, I'll give you an example. You look at this field. This is a field of oil sea rape, and it's full of flowers, isn't it? Okay? But of course, they want to maintain the highest crop yields, so one of the things that they do to do that is obviously to make sure they spray uh, out, out any potential pests that could cause a problem. You can understand why the farmers are doing this, but I'll give you an example uh, of how it impacts, because I used to, and I still do, do a lot of great crusted newt survey work, and as a constant, I go to visit ponds all over Cheshire, and I can remember vividly, vividly, crossing an oil seed rape field just like that over a hundred meters to get to this pond and it was a battle to get through this stuff i can tell you and i saw one bee and a couple of flies whilst i was crossing that field and i was watching i was like where are, where are these things because they'd sprayed it out and the problem with spraying to such a great degree is it actually removes the good stuff as well as the dodgy stuff. So, and, and here's the problem. The dodgy stuff, the pests, if you like, they recover quicker than the good stuff. So I'll give you another good example. I had a sort of field of oilseed rape near where I was, but it wasn't yet in flower. It was, it was in late winter. It was loaded with meadow pipits, loaded with them, feeding, feasting on the insect life in there. You spray the field, no meadow pipits. Why? Because all the food is gone, he's dead. Later on, they were spraying it again about six weeks later because the pests had increased. But there were no good insects left. There were no, there were no ladybirds left to prey on the aphids. And it's like this, you'd like to end up accelerating the amount of pesticides used. And it's worse than that because you guys, you're great. You think, I want to protect the bees. I want, to, I want the pollinators to do really, really well. And so do I. So I'll go just like you to a garden centre and I will purchase fantastic nectar bearing, pollen bearing flowers that will go through different seasons that will bees will feast on, all sorts of other insects as well, hoverflies, you name it. And I think I'm doing the good thing. And then it turns out that for decades and decades they've been filling them full of neonicotinoid pesticides, all sorts of before you bought them. So you put them in and they're already killing bees. So when you go to the garden centre, around 90% of these things, by the way, are, are, have got pesticides on to some degree. When you go to the garden centre, you need to say which ones have got the neonicotinoids in, which ones have got pesticides in, because they may not have been sprayed in this country. Many of them are imported and have been sprayed elsewhere where things like neonicotinoids are still allowed to be used. So treat, treat your garden as, a, as, a, as an experiment, if you like, and make sure you're not putting the, the toxic plants into your garden. One thing you can do is sort of join in with, thing, with various things. Lots of organisations run petitions, and you're going to be saying to yourself, well, I signed that petition. I never knew if it was a success. I don't know if it's worthwhile. I can't be bothered with petitions. Well, sometimes they do work, you know. The petitions for, for trying to reduce the use of neonicotinoids did have an effect on our government. So every now and again, they'll be successful. But agriculture has to be... Um, has to be actively uh, looked at in terms of its impact, but also we can do so much better with the land that's not being farmed. I've actually seen uh, examples where the farmers were coming outside of their land and going along the verges along the roads and spraying the verges alongside the roads, presumably with the idea that there's pests coming from there that might get onto their fields. Just absolutely crazy. Here's the problem, though. There's lots of other uh, sort of outcomes from all of this. 
Okay, and we've been hearing a lot about it in the news recently. Farming, they're not doing it on purpose. If you're a farmer, I'm not having to go at you as an individual or as, as a, even as a group, really, because you're, you're, you're economically driven in what you're trying to do. But the, the consequences of farming without too much thought about the consequences is things like runoff. And the runoff that comes off our farmland is loaded with fertilizers, it's loaded with pesticides, uh, it's, load, it's, all, it's loaded with all kinds of potentially harmful things. And we've changed the way that we farm. Many, many farms, the farmer themselves isn't the person in the tractor that's plowing. They have often contracted out the plowing and things like that so that these contractors go from farm to farm to farm and they want to get around those fields as the fastest possible way. And so they may not be thinking about the conservation of the soil, for instance, which is a big problem in the UK. And I've seen farmers, and this is one, or people going up and down a hill. Problem with going up and down a hill is it accelerates the speed with which you get soil creep and it increases the amount of runoff. And when you get runoff, it ends up in our rivers. And then you get eutrophication of the river systems and you also get poisoning of the system. The insect life within the rivers, get, they get poisoned with insecticides. And this happens on a grand scale. And the, probably the best way to show you how this works, which remember the big floods a few years ago, the famous photographs. See all that? That was when the big floods were on a few years back. What's that brown stuff? And it's not what you think. What is it? That soil, that soil coming off farmland, washing into the rivers and out into the ocean. We can't carry on losing soil at that rate. And we certainly can't afford for all those pesticides and nutrients to be getting into the system. And there's a lot of nutrients getting into the system, as we know right now. I don't mind who you vote for politically, but I'm going to tell you now that at least one environment secretary, I won't name her, called Truss. <laughs> at least one environment secretary just went straight into the become secretary for the Secretary of State for the Environment. And without finding out anything, she demanded a 25% cut in that department's expenditure. And as a consequence of that, the people who inspect our rivers, the people who go out and measure the damage that's being done. The people who prosecute, the people who shouldn't be polluting our rivers but do, they're not there anymore because they were the sort of people that got cut from the Environment Agency. And that's why, one of the main reasons why our rivers are now going back into the state that they are going because that, de that department has never recovered those funds that were doing that important job. Anyway, I digress, as I often do. I know that this is pesticides and herbicides because when I go to urban areas and get my hoover out, when I hoover for insects and things, if I go to, you know, somewhere that's not got lots of pesticide use and not lots of herbicide use, it could be an urban park. I'm getting more insects per two minutes of hoovering by an exponential amount. You know, sort of like 10 times the number of insects are coming out into my system to be examined and, and identified, then I'm getting off farmland. Even on the verges where it looks verdant, I'll be hoovering those in the farmland, there's nothing there. So that's the impact that we're having on our environment. It really is catastrophic. And the farmers don't want to be doing that. Um, we're losing farmland, as we know, to things like this, to, uh, to the development that, that is kind of a bit odd, you know, it might be a brownfield site, that, do you know, it was a brownfield site, have you heard of Burton Wood Air Base? Yeah. This is Burton Wood Air Base, this is Amiga now. And they're only partly developed. How many buildings there can you see with solar panels on? I think, I think there might be one with a handful on. But how much power could be generated from that? That's just an aside, that's sustainability. That's, that's, us not needing to have nuclear power. That's us not needing to keep going with oil-based uh, energy supplies or, or uh, 
gas-based energy supplies. How many of these buildings are there around the country? Just think how much power that could be generating. So rather than, you know, you can put it on the farm fields, but you can just as easily put it on the fields that have now been taken over by great big sheds and put them on there. And, and if I come back to the, to the brownfield thought, brownfields are some of the most biodiverse places you can possibly go to. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't be redeveloping areas that have already been developed. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that we should probably be thinking about protecting the best ones in terms of biodiversity. Because if you go and check out a brownfield site like this, which has now got houses on it where the company's gone bust and they're just halfway through and they've done it five, gone bust five times, that, that field there was supporting little ring plovers, ring plovers, lapwing, all kinds of stuff. Of course, it's got habitat's going to change over time, but it was also super rich in invertebrates. The neighboring farmland, nothing. Not much at all. So brown fields are biodiverse, and we should probably be thinking carefully about what we do with them because they're not wasted spaces. All right? They're probably the, the last vestiges of reservoirs of nature in many an urban situation or suburban situation, whatever it may be. Uh, some of them are incredible, and they have been turned into nature reserves. So don't always imagine that a brown field is a bad place. And people like Bug Life campaign to make the government realise that developing every brown field is not necessarily the way to go to protect biodiversity, to maintain our targets for protecting nature, which we have set in policy. Now, I'm going to divert ever so slightly here, because we're all responsible. We're all responsible for what's happening in our environment. Who eats strawberries? Go on, put your hand up. Not my favourite, I prefer blueberries, but then I go. Right, uh, anybody had a strawberry in the last couple of weeks? Oh, see all these hands going up? Right, you get out, go <laughs> No, we do, we eat strawberries all the time. Do you remember we always ate, ate strawberries in June, July, that sort of period, yes. when it's seasonal? Okay, well, to have strawberries now, there's a requirement to have them grown somewhere else and imported, isn't there? Most of our strawberries come from here. Anyone know where that is? Yeah, Almeria. Almeria. <laughs> the thing is that um, we've got a globalised system in place in terms of food now. It's a very different system. It's not going to change, so there's no point in us, you know, getting too hungry for it, but we can still do things better. But that is, that's the consequence of us requiring strawberries in the winter. And it brings this question very much to my mind. It's how big is our plastic footprint? It's much bigger than we think it is, even if we're living a very puritanical life. You know, I only eat strawberries in June when Wimbledon's on. You know, if we're doing that, then, you know, when we've still got a big plastic footprint, I've got a big plastic footprint. Every single one of you in here... We can't beat ourselves up about that too much, but so long as we're trying to do things to redress it, then we're making an effort. But we are sadly drowning, genuinely drowning in plastic. Some of you will have seen some of the programs uh, that were, were put out quite res recently. Liz Bonin did a superb one uh, four or five years ago. Um, and when you see images like this, very often these images will be taken from sort of Southeast Asia, places like that. But I've seen, I go out to the salt marshes of, uh, of the, the Mersey and the D, and my section of the, the estuary that I'm monitoring between sort of uh, Witness and Runcorn and Warrington, I can be walking across the marshes there and they're cracking under my feet from all the plastic. Um, it is pretty terrifying. I've been on the, on, on the ocean and you look down and there's not that much plastic on the surface and you think, oh, it's, it's, you know, there's the odd bit here and there. And then you look down and there's layer after layer after layer of plastic under the water. It is absolutely terrifying in places. One of the reasons we have this is we have these things called gyres, which kind of collect up the plastic in a given area and the great uh, Pacific uh, garbage patch is, is bigger. I don't know why we always say this, but it's bigger than the size of Wales. Wales is this universal measure of scale. I, I just, I just, 
I don't know what it is about, but basically it's absolutely ginormous. But you've got lots of these examples along the UK, all sorts of places. Here's the consequence of that plastic. This is a photograph of, um, of a laysan albatross uh, that was uh, taken in uh, Midway Island. And it's absolutely shocking. Basically, the bird died from ingestion of uh, plastic and uh, couldn't, couldn't then digest the food that was being given that was okay. Uh, anywhere you go in the world, uh, seabirds are seriously affected by plastic. This is flesh-footed shearwater that I photographed in a place called Huraki Gulf. Some of you may have been to northern, um, northern New Zealand. Uh, this is where I photographed it, but it breed, breeds, uh, you know, in that sort of Australasia, Southeast Asia area. And when you go and examine the contents of the stomachs of the chicks in the burrows, some of them never get out of the burrows because they died. And when they examine them, they're full of plastic. Full and full of plastic. Uh, they, they're they saying, and plastic pollution goes on. Has anybody bought a child a card with glitter on? Go on, admit it. Don't be, I'm not going to personally criticise you. We've all made that mistake. Because now, even on Scone Ryan and locally, we're finding that birds are eating glitter. Because glitter's plastic. The glitter that we see is not made out of stones, it's plastic. Okay? And um, it goes on, on this, this is brand new, updated 13th of November, 2022. So it goes on and on and I could show you any number of these things, but it's not just birds, turtles, you name it. In this case, it's got 317 pieces of plastic found in this dead green turtle. Um, can you believe that? I mean, it's just astonishing, isn't it? And, and the amount of plastic that is there, it, it's weird what it affects and how it affects it, because it's not all about ingestion. In this case, it's an oyster catcher. It could have been on the beach at Point of Air or somewhere like that. And it's gone and stuck its bill straight through one of those, you know, squeezy bottle top things, and, and it's got its bill stuck in there, so it can't feed. But I'll take you back to those strawberries, shall I? Because I like to digress and then come back. Anybody's had a strawberry in the last few days, you might want to reconsider what you're doing, because here's a sperm web <laughs> off Spain that died from ingesting plastic. A 17 kilogram sheet of plastic that came from one of Almeria's many, many greenhouses, plastic greenhouses, but this one just happened to be labeled. So we know it came from a greenhouse that Tesco had as a supplier for its strawberries in the UK. So that sperm whale died directly as a result of our strawberry addiction. Um, and it goes on. I mean, there are many, many examples of it. I mean, even the remotest parts of the planet, the remotest parts of the planet, are now heavily impacted. Henderson Island is 3,000 miles from anywhere in the Pacific. Oh, by the way, we own it. You didn't know that, did you? Did you know that we own more offshore islands than any other nation on Earth? Did you know that? Many of them nowhere near us. And we own Henderson Island. But it had 38 million pieces of plastic on its beaches from a recent collection survey stuff. Do you know how many people live there? None. None. That is utterly shocking. But it gets worse because guess what? At some point, we're going to realize that we are plastic because we're eating it. All right. If you belong, if you, if you, if you, somebody who <laughs> works for birds, don't blow me up because I've added that bit. <laughs> British hand cooked potato chips with sea salt and microplastics. Why do I say it's got microplastics in it? Because sea salt is full of microplastics and it can't be avoided. It's the tiniest thing. But we are literally ingesting plastic now all the time. There's virtually no organisms that you can find that don't have plastic in them. Uh, I became, became aware of this. You know, over time, uh, Scotland's announced a deposit return scheme for plastic as, you know, in a way of trying to counteract what's going on for plastic and glass. We're trying to do things. We are trying to, you know, it's Seattle fairly recently banned plastic straws. And if you might have noticed that plastic straws are starting to disappear from places where you went for a drink. Remember when it, do you remember when you go for a cocktail? And then I can look at some of you guys and you've had a cocktail or two. I can tell that for a fact. 
But you've gone out there and you've had a cocktail and they always stick a straw in, even if you don't want a straw. Have you noticed that? Or a stupid umbrella. And, they, and it's plastic as well. And they stick this straw in and you can look, oh, it's plastic. And you don't need a plastic straw. There are loads of alternatives to plastic straws. So if you get, go somewhere, I'd say, is that, are the straws plastic? Say, I don't want one. Or say, are the straws, straws plastic? No, great, I'll have one. Thank you very much. That's fine. So things are changing. Companies are getting on board with the idea of reducing our plastic burden. And they'll need to. Iceland is kind of at the forefront of that. They reckon within, you know, next 12 months maybe, they may be free of it. The trouble is, we keep having governments, and I'm not specifically talking about any party, not political party, but we keep having governments who think just by saying something, it's going to change something. And it rarely does. You need a government to legislate. We put people into power to put in place policies and in those policy arrangements they have to bring in legislation because without legislation people don't do things. They avoid doing things and legislation is what, it's not red tape, it's what's going to save the planet. If you want to red tape you can wrap yourself in red plastic tape and watch the planet go down the Nile or wherever it is, and end up in the bin. But we need regulation to make things work. But I will say this, you have a part to play. It's not just about the government. We have to change our behaviours voluntarily. Didn't expect that, did you? How much does it cost to wash your hair? Is there anybody in here? Oh, there's one or two bald blokes, so I might not, this might not be applicable. How many people in here need to wash their hair? Okay, I notice it's mostly ladies that said that. Um, so, just washing our hair comes at a cost to the planet. Uh, it's not just, it's not just the, what you might expect. The, the planet is interconnected. So when you wash your hair, most of the time, your hair product has palm oil in it. Now, palm oil is a very useful Products, I'm not in denial of that, it's an amazing product, but the problem is that only a very small amount of the production of palm oil comes from certified sites. There are a bunch of cowboys out there, but unfortunately there are a bunch of companies buying the uncertified palm oil. So they, what they, in order to create these palm oil um, uh, producing sites, this is what happens, all right? It's wanton destruction of tropical forests, principally. And as a consequence of that, you know, some of the most iconic creatures on the planet are at the point where they're very much in danger of extinction. So when you go to buy your hair product, see who's producing it. See where they're getting their palm oil from. And you can go into the internet to find this out. I don't have to lecture you and show you which one. I'm not telling you which ones you should or shouldn't buy, even though Procter and Gamble are up there. I shouldn't tell you which ones that you should. I mean, Head and Shoulders is one of the worst. Head and Shoulders is one of the worst, you know. They still haven't got all of their palm oil from certified sources. Why not? Why not? Okay. This is the latest survey data. A firm, the World Wildlife Fund, uh, and just that Ferrero, unbelievably, Ferrero Rocher, right, people, uh, were the ones that had made the most progress in using, uh, phasing out unsustainable palm oil. They're the only ones that actually hit the target, right? All of these other brands, L'Oreal, Ikea, Marks and Spencer, Aldi, they're doing okay. They're doing okay, but they've got a way to go still. But you know what? Right down at the bottom, Jacobs, Dow Egberts, Whitbread, Whole Foods, Mar Greg's, Greg's, who knew? You thought it was all about a sausage roll. Who knew? Greg's have got to do better. And the only way they can do better is by you changing what you do. Because they will move when consumer pressure dictates that they have to change what they're doing. So if you go into Greg's and every time you go in, and I know you're still going to go in, most of you, Although one or two said I wouldn't, I wouldn't darken Greg's doorstep. <laughs> it's the local bakery for me. But if you do go in, you can say, look, you know, you're not doing well. 
you're not doing well on your uncertified palm oil. Can you make that comment to your manager? Can you make that comment so that he passes it on to the people in the boards and things like that? Or you can just stop going there if you want to. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just saying that's public pressure that has the best effect on commodities. How about coffee? Anyone? I love coffee. Who has coffee? Yeah, how much does your coffee cost? £2.50, £3. Oh, it's gone expensive, hasn't it, in the last year or so? Oh, that cost of living crisis is starting to pinch a bit. But it was already pinching on the natural environment long, long before that. Because one of the ways that we produce coffee now is to chop down amazing biodiverse forests to grow coffee in sunlit situations. Coffee doesn't naturally grow in sunlit situations. It naturally grows as an understory plant within a complicated forest setting. That's where it comes from. Uh, this is what it's normally like. And this is a shade grown coffee plantation. Now this is important because the difference in biodiversity is even to your eye going to be humongous. The, the variety of life that it supports is just off the scale compared to that one that's grown in the sun. And it doesn't have to be grown in the sun. The reason they grow it in the sun is because it gets a blight, which is worse under the conditions in the forest. So, you know, they've elected to chop the forest down to reduce the amount of blight impact on the coffee. If you want to do better, Rainforest Alliance logo on your coffee product is a start, all right? Because these people are about protecting the rainforest. And what you are looking for is shade-grown coffee. It's ever so important, but if, especially if your coffee is coming from Central America and the northern parts of South America, it is absolutely critical. RSPB, as you can see, are on track with this. Why is it so important? Well, just from uh, the perspective of the migratory birds, the neotropical migrants, as they are called, this is where they go to for the winter. When you've been to North America, put your hands up if you've been to North America, okay, Canada, and you'll have seen some amazingly stunning, beautiful birds like the northern perula and the black and white warbler, or maybe red-eyed vireo. Uh, or myrtle warbler, or something like that. You know, you've seen all of these birds and swains and thrushes and uh, maybe even things like the wood thrush. If you've been in Central Park and seen these on migration, or something like that, where are they going? They're going here. All right, this is where they're heading for. And you can see the total species richness. The darker it is, that part of the map, that's where the species richness is. Now, lots of our coffee comes from places like Costa Rica. Honduras, Nicaragua, all right? Where it's darkest, do you know what I mean? They've got 680 unique species just in those areas, let alone the neotropicals that are going up now. So anytime you buy Central American coffee-based coffee, please make sure it's shade grown. If it's not shade grown, then you're contributing to the loss of habitats. There is a lot of effort now to try and reduce the loss uh, and the COP and the biodiversity conferences, they're starting to work, they're starting to have an effect, but it's still consumers. It's consumers that make the difference. Now, I don't know about you, I, my back's done half hurt at the moment. I did something the other day, you know you step in a hole or something, I stepped in a hole on when I was doing a survey, and ever since then I've been walking around with a slightly strange gait. Um, not, not a gate that you close, a, a, just a strange gate. Um, and I probably, I did talk, I took some ibuprofen, I took some ibuprofen, but, um, any of you on anti-inflammatories? Anybody on anti-inflammatories here? You can't tell me you're not on anti-inflammatories. Look at the age of you. Come on. I'm not being funny. I'm not being funny, but we've all reached that point. Come on. Um, <laughs> a little while back, in India, you could go to India, and you see cattle wandering in the streets, you still do. But when you saw cattle die, what you'd also see was this. Vultures, they were nature's sort of undertakers. Got rid of all that, those carcasses and things, because of course the Hindus don't eat the meat and stuff. 
Uh, do you know how many there were? 90 million. 90 million vultures. By 1999, the situation had got so bad that they couldn't find a pair of vultures together. Suddenly, in a, just over a decade, <coughs> all the vultures disappeared. And there are all kinds of theories. Oh, they've got a disease. Got a disease? They eat dead things. If anything can resist a disease, it's a vulture. All right? And then everything started to pile up. And they started to suspect that it was something that we were doing. Well, yeah, I think that's pretty blinding obvious, but it, it, it was something we were doing was affecting them. And so they then started looking at all kinds of different products. And eventually, it turned out that the product that was killing all of these vultures was diclofenac. Now, if you want to know what diclofenac is used in, it's things like this. Yeah, the gels and things that you use to ease the inflammation. You know, the tablets that you take to reduce inflammation, it's, it contains diclofenac. And it's produced by companies like Bayer and, and other, other companies. But they did an awful good job of pointing the finger in other directions for a good number of years by querying the study findings and things like that. But no, it was the, it was the diclofenac. Um, and it's, the reason it happened is because vets started prescribing diclofenac to the cattle and the sheep and the things like that. And so when they died, it turns out that birds in particular are incredibly susceptible to the poisoning through diclofenac. Um, and that's literally what caused the death of all those vultures. There's lots of recovery schemes in the, underway. It's banned its use. But hey, the same companies want bets in Europe to use diclofenac. And they were trying to make sure they were selling it here uh, to vets to give to cattle and sheep and everything in different parts. I mean, if you go to Extremadura, you see all those vultures. Well, if you start giving diclofenac to all those sheep and those cattle, what's going to happen to all those vultures? And so there was a big campaign to... Uh, within the European Union, and at the time we were still in it, to try and avoid um, the diclofenac being used in the, in the industry. It's now got under tight control, but there are still instances of our European vultures being destroyed by the diclofenac uh, effect. Um, it's, it's a real difficult issue, but we, can't, I, we cannot annihilate all the vultures because, we, because of a product that we know is doing the damage. It's just, it's uh, so irresponsible. I put beyond anything else, it's just like, you know, it's like me splitting you guys in half and this side, you're going to survive, okay? And this side, you're not going to survive unless I give you diclofenac, okay, or something like that. And so I go, oh, I'll give you guys over here some diclofenac. And yeah, you, you will, some of you will survive. You guys are all right. But what happens... If I stop giving you all diclofenac, what's going to happen? Because you know what? We could use other things. We could do other things. We're clever. We're smart. All right? We can find something else. We are the smartest thing on the planet. Well, so the dumbest thing on the planet. But we're the smartest thing on the planet. All those things that we put, we can come up with an alternative that'll save you all. Save you all. So let's try and save all that biodiversity by doing sensible things. And I'm going to show you something really, really sensible. Now, this is tuna. Tuna. There's loads of bluefin tuna at the moment off Cornwall and places like that. Did you know that? Who eats tuna? Okay. I eat tuna. I'll tell you what eats tuna. Uh, all kinds of animals. Not necessarily whales and dolphins, but certainly, um, you know, they end up pallying up with them. If ever you see tuna you'll often see dolphins. They're not eating the tuna, but they're eating the things that the tuna is also chasing. All right? So if you see, if you see tuna, you'll usually see dolphins in the same places. They're chasing the same food. And this is how it works. Okay? They're chasing a bait ball. Of course we want to catch that bait ball because we want to eat it. And all over the world, her staining is going on around these tunas, tuna shoals, because they want the tuna and they want the bait fit and they want everything. And this is what was happening. And all those things trying to escape there, are not tuna, what are they? They're dolphins. 
So if you're eating tuna, you are definitely going to be affecting marine life, whether it's tuna or dolphins or anything. And the only way that you can avoid doing that is pointless looking at the thing that says dolphin friendly. It's not really dolphin friendly because loads of other stuff gets affected, right? Not just dolphins. It's not really friendly to wildlife. The only way you can be sure that you're doing the minimum amount of damage to the environment if you are eating tuna is to make sure that the tuna that you are eating says caught by responsible fishing methods, but it says pole and line caught. If it is not pole and line caught, you are still impacting heavily even if it says dolphin friendly, unless it says specifically pole and line, it is killing lots of excess bycatch. Turtles, all kinds, you know, shark, you name it, it's catching it. This is what you need. Otherwise, this is what you get. A manta ray caught in the same thing that's, you know, when they're targeting the tuna. Or a shark. Talking about sharks, we are annihilating the world's sharks. What are we annihilating it for? Soup. Shark fin soup. Has anybody eaten shark fin soup here? Don't, I'm, not going to have, I'm not going to have a go at you. Here's the consequence though of shark fin soup. All right, this is the reality of shark fin soup. It's pretty horrific this picture, be ready for this. Okay. So there's a hammerhead, sculpt hammerhead. It's had its fins cut off. It's alive, I'm throwing it back in. And this is the reality of shark fin soup. Okay. Every one of those fins has come from a shark. So three or four of those fins constitutes one shark. When you total it up, well over 70 million sharks are killed annually for shark fin soup. They're at the top of the chain. They're the apex predators, you know, in the, in the, they, they are required for balance. Please, please, please do not eat shark fin soup. Discourage any of your friends and relatives from eating shark fin soup. Because only by changing what we're doing, can we uh, stop the slaughter, the needless slaughter? There's all kinds of bycatch that goes on uh, with this sort of stuff. This is the reality of our fishing industries. You know, these are Hector's dolphins in New Zealand. So many of our whales and dolphins are caught up in, in uh, the stuff that we use for catching the fish. So we need to change what we're doing. Lots of the humpback whales, for instance, lots of the northern right whales get caught in crab lines that go down. Well, do you know what? They've come up with new technologies. Because I want to put, look, I'm looking at your faces. You're all glum. I'm going to put a smile on your face. We've got new technology. Do you know what it is? You can now put a crab pot down. And there's a pinger. And after a while, the pinger goes and it comes back to the surface. And then they, they, they bring it back in without a line. So when the, when the whales go into the areas where all these crab pots with the lines that they used to get caught on in, in, in uh, Maine and places like that, the crab lines aren't there anymore. They've got a new technology with, so we can do it. We can come up with clever stuff. We can reduce our impact on the environment. But you know, the impact that we're having is astronomic. It is astronomic. And of course, some of the, some of the real base components uh, of what we're trying to harvest and what we're trying to, to use might blow your mind a little bit because you think, why, why on earth are we doing that? Uh, do you know that omega-3 actually comes from, um, from algae? Did you know that? But, but then it gets consumed by creatures, and then you collect the omega-3 from the creatures. Do you know that? Mm. You do now. And most of the krill that's been harvested in the Antarctic region, mostly by the Chinese, is going for uh, aqu aqu aquaculture, for aquariums, for aquaculture. But what feeds on that krill? The biggest creature well, on the planet feeds on that krill. We can't be taking out the base of the food chain. We just cannot be doing that. So there's got to be pressure to change that. And also we've got to go, hang on, why are we going and taking the krill out when we can farm the algae? You know, we've got to do sensible <coughs> things. It has all kinds of consequences. And I'm going to come to one of my hot topics. Albatrosses. I crossed many, many, many oceans, the southern oceans included, where all that krill is. And albatrosses are one of the things that I see 
very frequently. I've seen most of the world's species. Um, and 17 out of the 22 species are threatened with extinction. Uh, some of them are exceedingly close to extinction. To give you an example, the Campbell Island albatross, okay, there's a 47% decline, you can see that, since 1966. You're thinking, well, that's not too bad. Well, most of that was down to longline fisheries, most of that damage. The Antipodean albatross, over the same period, 50% decline, gets worse. Amsterdam albatross, there are just 32 pairs left. All right? But, um, and they're not just albatrosses affected, things like white chin petrels and many other species are affected. Now, most of that has come from long line fisheries where the, the, the birds have been grabbing the, the things like the squid and stuff that they're catching just as they're coming back up. They'll grab the line, then they get caught on the hooks, and then they get dragged into the mechanism and, and they get killed. But guess what? Do you remember that money that I was telling you about? You wonder if it's going to do any good. Well, Albatross Task Force was formed through that money, and they go all over the world changing the practices of the fisheries. And now, the, and, and most of the fisheries where, say, say a thousand birds would be killed within a, a two-month period in a given fishery, now you might get one because of the change in practice. So that money does make a difference, and all that money goes to this. So, Gough Island. Where's Gough Island? Tristan de Kuna, that area. All right, guess who owns it? Ooh. Oh yeah, <laughs> who knew? Um, got the Tristan bunting on it. It's got the Tristan albatross on it. Tristan albatross is a type of wandering albatross. It's not long line fisheries threatening the Tristan albatross. Guess what it is? Mice. Mice. All right, this is footage from Goff Island. And uh, it's, uh, it says 60% of all Goff's chicks die in the nest from attacks by the mice mostly. Uh, and actually, the numbers are worse than that uh, because they do know that sometimes uh, from over a thousand uh, nests, 1,500 nests, they've got like 16, 17 successful fledging chicks. And they've even now got evidence that these mice have been eating the adults on the nest as well. Back in 2014, it was the worst year ever, 163 chicks survived from 1,700 Nest. And that means you're not producing enough youngsters and gradually you get this, you know, this inexorable decline. However, don't lose hope, guys, because the RSPB, and that means you and lots of other people are, are riding to the rescue. You are the knights. You are the knights in shining armor. You are the people on the white charger riding over the hill with the britches. I know that's got some of you going. Um, and Gough Island Restoration Program is underway. Now, do you know what it means? Those mice are going to die. Because the only way to save the albatross is you've got to get rid of mice. The mice are not native to Gough Island. We accidentally introduced them. We have to redress the balance. Otherwise, all those albatrosses and pretty much every single seabird on those islands, of which there are 17, 18 different species of seabird breeding on those islands, are going to be destroyed. We have to remove them, which means killing all the mice. Um, but it's better than the alternative. So longline fisheries, pollution, climate change, gill netting, human disturbance, trawl fishing, all having an impact on our wildlife. But we can change what we're doing to reduce the impact. We won't get rid of it entirely but we can reduce the impact. I realize I've been already talking for a good long while. Um, so I'll just do this last bit. I'll give you, somebody wanted five minute warning. Did you? Go on, I'll give you a five minute warning now then. Because these guys are going to be thirsty. <laughs> the estimated cost to clear Gough Island is 9.1 million pounds. That sounds a lot of money, doesn't it? It takes three years at least to do it. Uh, sounds like a lot of money. But it's not a lot of money, you know, because um, we've all seen in, in recent days that, that, you know, governments don't seem to think that £65 billion is a lot to pay for an idea. Uh, so, um, you know, so £9.1 billion is not much, but you've raised that much. You've done it. Not all in the hat, but you've done it. All right. 
You've raised that money because what it does, by raising that money, you're able to lever in more funding. You know, you might raise a thousand pounds, but that thousand pounds can create ten thousand pounds and so on and so forth. It's incredible what you can do just by starting the effort. And so we're going to save, we are going to save the wildlife of Goth Island. And that's because you guys have contributed to that. It's a real thing that you've achieved. We have to change attitudes of those people at the top. This is a William Blake thing, all right? The tree which moves some to tears of joy is in the eyes of others only a green thing that stands in the way. Some see nature all ridicule and deformity, and some scarce see nature at all. But to the eyes of the man and the woman <laughs> of imagination, nature is imagination itself. And that's how I feel, and I know that's how nearly all of you in here feel too. But a lot of people do not feel that. They have no empathetic association with the natural world. They know what a pound sign is. They understand the value of a pound or a dollar or a yen or whatever it may be. That is how they measure the world. But the world is not a pound coin that dropped on the floor then. It is not. I hope it was a pound coin because it could go in that hat. If it, um, it, it, it's not a pound coin. It is not a dollar. It is not. It is everything else. Okay? We need to create space for the natural environment. There are people in the world, a type of economist that believes that everything is better if it is altered by man. They actually believe that. That is their mantra. They're called libertarians. Okay, that's what their, uh, their philosophy, that's their philosophy. Um, could you imagine a world without any rainforest? Could you imagine a world without a desert? Could you imagine a world where there isn't even, you know, you go to Abernethy, you go to, you go to the Lake District, you, there's nothing, everything is man-made. Could you imagine that? That is their ultimate ideal. It's crazy. And it's, it's certain death, by the way, but, you know, just mind mind that. Um, why have we got to this point? Well, I'm not going to blame any one particular thing, but it's because we have become disconnected. Disconnected in a gigantic way from the natural environment. Who remembers plant a tree in 73? And don't tell me none of you remember it. <laughs> You're, I'm looking around, I think, well, maybe one or two of you didn't make it to 1973, but the rest of you did. I was there. I planted a tree in 73. Did you put your hands up if you planted a tree in 73? Look at all those hands, there's three of us. <laughs> Who planted one more in 74? Yeah. I did. Um, when I was a child, at school, the nature table was quite a big part of school. That thing where you brought something in and you explained to the rest of the class what it was. And it, you kind of can, you could poo poo the idea. You could, you could poo poo the idea that it's important. But it wasn't, it was vastly important to me and to a significant number of other people as well. And even those people who didn't think it was important, some of that sank in. And then it got dropped. For many, 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 many years, the idea of the nature table was naff and it was dropped. And in fact, nature was effectively dropped from most of the national curriculum. The consequences of that is quite stark because I think I'm going to lay my cards on the table here, literally. I'm going to say 100% of you in this room know what that bird is. Is that correct? Put your hands up if you don't know what that bird is. All right. So about 10 years ago now, I was delivering a project in schools, primary schools. It's called Primary Feathers. And 
I would go into the schools and I would show them a whole host of birds that they would see in and around their schools, including this bird. Now, what struck me was how few children recognized <laughs> the robin, the Eurasian robin. Our national bird, effectively, even though we don't officially have one. David Lindo tried to make it official a few years back. But by the by, everybody knows the robin. It's on every Christmas card, you know. Except, of course, we take that for granted, and it's not true. Because maybe 10, 15% of the children could recognize a robin. A much smaller percentage could recognize things like blackbirds and goldfinches and stuff like that. But what I found the most disturbing was that 30 or 40% of the teachers couldn't recognize a robin. Couldn't identify a robin. These are primary school teachers. But what I discovered was that almost universally, those teachers were under the age of 30. And they had come from the generations that had gone through schools. Obviously, they're going to be 40 odd now. They come through the time when nature was written out of the curriculum, out of the school year. And it struck me that a huge number of our population have no connection at all with even the most fundamental parts of our natural environment. But there are things that it's not all doom and gloom. We can change that. We can reconnect with community. We can change policy by pressure so that it becomes apparent that nature is part of our society. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of items. So we all know the common swift. We possibly all know that the common swift has been going through a significant decline, mainly from the loss of nest sites. Well, you can counteract that by putting up nest sites, but you can also do things like inform your council, local authority, that swifts nest in a given area. And they have a, a, an instruction now to protect those nest sites. And it may be that there's refurbishments going on on something like a, a local authority controlled housing area or, ha you know, or, an, or a trust, housing trust or something like that. That's where most of the swifts seem to be in the old housing stuff. But when they upgrade them, they do things like plastic soffits and stuff like this. And of course, that swifts lose their. So if you know where there are swifts, you know where there are swifts, please go and let the local authority know so they can make sure steps are taken to protect them. Putting up boxes is quite simple. We can do it for all kinds of wildlife, whether it be, you know, whether it be uh, swifts or anything else. You can put all kinds of boxes up everywhere. We can improve the, the opportunities. You can even do it for bats. You can put bat boxes up on your local trees or on your side of your house. And they do work. All right? They do work. Or you can change the way you garden change all kinds of things you could let that grass grow do you know what I do in our garden in Edgeley it's a wild lawn you know we're kind of putting all kinds of plants in but it's like a wild lawn and our neighbours on the right hand side look over our lawn and they go oh that's what I want so she had plastic grass down she's taking the plastic grass up she's wilding her garden the neighbours on the other side are not so impressed. Uh, but, but we can't win all the hearts and all the minds. But if you want to improve your wildlife in your garden, do you know one of the most significant things you can do? Put a pond in. Put a pond in. It's amazing what will turn up. This pond, four or five years later. Yeah, eating the frogs and also possibly the great crested newts that were in there. And as an ecologist... Great Crested Newts form a significant part of my income annually because obviously Great Crested Newt is heavily protected. But as an ecologist, I spent years be beyond frustration with what we were doing in terms of protecting Great Crested Newts because it was primarily plastic that was protecting the Great Crested Newt from development uh, by stopping them. You've seen it. You've driven along the motorways. You've seen the plastic all along the motorways. You wonder what it was. It was about Great Crested Newt. How ridiculous. Because where does all that plastic go when we finished? Into landfill yeah. or whatever. You know, so it's just absolutely nuts what's happening now. Thankfully, it's changing. The money is now going into, into a fund. It's called district level licensing. Uh, and the money from that now goes to protecting uh, areas where they create better uh, habitat. 
for newts, for breed, they're called breeding ponds, the breeding ponds. Weirdly, when they set up the system, they forgot all about the terrestrial habitat. Great Christian Newt spends two thirds or more of its life in its terrestrial form, feeding on invertebrates. How, how they could have failed to recognize that natural England, I do not know. But anyway, by the by, why does it make more sense? Because agricultural land actually doesn't cost that much, seven to 10,000 pounds per hectare, maybe gone up slightly since I put this slide up. And a digger driver costs 150 pounds a day, maybe about 170, 180 now, given the price rises in the last few months. Um, but you can dig an awful lot of ponds, even on a hectare, as long as it's protected, you know, for an exponential number of years, one of my favourite words tonight, for 30 years or more, then it means there's plenty of great Christian going to be breeding in those ponds. And yes, we might end up losing a few in the development areas, but you can, the meta population is going to be significantly bigger because you've increased the amount of available habitat for them overall. Now, when we look at our landscape all around us, we know what's wild and we know what's man-modified, urbanised. Well, we think we do. I look around the UK and I can barely see anything that isn't man-modified in some form or other. Even the highlands of Scotland. This looks wild, doesn't it? It's definitely man-modified, even if it is by sort of indirect <coughs> processes. And of course, this is where things like, you know, amazing birds of prey live, things like the fantastic golden eagle, where that lives. Unfortunately, in places like that, this animal also lives there, the native red grouse. Well, the native red grouse isn't really a wild bird in many respects anymore, because most of the areas with red grouse are like this. You go to Scotland, you go to Peak District, you go to North Yorkshire, you go to the Lake District, and you see this and you think, what's this? Is this, this, oh, this heather, oh, this heather, it's wild. It is not, it's a grouse farm. It's a grouse farm. Uh, uh, all those areas are burnt patches of heather. The idea is to generate more young heather, which will increase the availability of food for the grouse on the areas, which will increase the bag that people can go and shoot those grouse uh, from the glorious or inglorious 12th onwards. Um, and uh, some of you may have been on uh, a protest or two about what's going on with the grouse shooting areas because as a consequence of the, our obsession, or well, a small section of society's obsession with, with grouse shooting, it's actually affecting wildlife you may not anticipate. Things like mountain hares. How can it be affecting mountain hares? You go up there, you'll see mountain hares. Well, yeah, you will see mountain hares, but do you see them like this? You go up to the upland areas, you might find what's known as a stink pit. They shoot in various parts of the UK, mountain hares on grouse moors, because they are concerned that they might pass lupus and other things onto the grouse, which may affect the size of the bag. And that bag really ends up being money because it's about how many people they can get up there. To, with, with, and then we're talking about tens of thousands of pounds people are paying to go shoot the grouse up in this area. So losing a few thousand mountain hares across a certain area is not going to be a bother to them, except, of course, we've lost a massive percentage of our mountain hares simply because of the grouse industry. And of course, we've lost other things as well. Hen harriers, all right? Hen harriers are one of the most impacted species. But golden eagles are impacted as well because guess what golden eagles eat? Mountain hares. If you've got no mountain hares to eat, what do you eat? And if you eat grouse, what happens to you? Bang, yeah, okay, you're caught in a trap or whatever it may be. We've got a strange, a really odd balance of power in this country where a vested interest of a small number of people outweighs the opinions, the sentiments of the vast majority of the population. They carry more weight. They have more money. Uh, the attacks are absolutely terrible. This is brand new, right? 15th of November, 2022. Do you know when the worst year 
for persecution of raptors was in the UK? Have a guess. 2020. What happened in 2020? COVID. All right. Who weren't in the countryside looking at what was going on? You, me, and a dog named Sue. All right. We weren't out there because we were locked down. But the gamekeepers weren't locked down. And the other people that were persecuting them. We heard of vicarious liability. Do you know what the second worst year was before I'm even moving aside? Do you know what the second worst year? I reckon 2021. It's getting worse. Vicarious liability refers to the situation where someone who is held responsible for the actions or omissions of another person. It happens all the time in industry. You know, if, if National Rail or whatever, if, they, if one of their, if an accident happens, the people in charge also get blamed as well as the people who may have made a mistake because it's vicarious responsibility, uh, liability. And um, an employer can be liable for the acts or omissions of their employers, provided it can be shown that they took place in the course of their employment. Well, the murdering of raptors is absolutely in the course of their employment. Uh, and killing of other wildlife as well, mountain hares, etc., etc. So why in the UK, in England specifically, does vicarious liability not apply to the owners of grouse moors? Well done, that person. Okay, because of who they are and who they're connected to. It's principally the reason, because everybody else has vicarious liability. Thankfully, in Scotland, that's now coming in. Gamekeepers, as a whole, may be decent people. I don't, you know, you know I'm not making, I'm not identifying individuals in, uh, particularly. I'm not making any, I don't want to denigrate gamekeepers, but principally gamekeepers are forced by the uh, pressures on them from their, from their employers, the landowners, to keep the bags as high as they can. And in order to do that, they feel that they've got to take all kinds of things that they may not want to do. Some clearly do, because this guy was caught chasing, was caught being chased by the RSPB and the police after he'd killed two short-eared owls. Anybody seen a short-eared owl eat a grouse? I mean, they much prefer... Macrotus voles, you know, they prefer short tail field voles. Uh, so why you'd want to kill, you know, basically anything with a, a talon or a, or a hooked beak is going to get to be a target. Uh, there are people that, that log what's going on, people like raptor persecution, and they advertise it, they publicise it. And we have hen harrier days, protests all over the UK. Some of you may have been on a hen harrier day. Who's been on a hen harrier day? It's all those hands. This was the one that I organised at Parkgate four or five years ago, just before the uh, COVID struck. So, you know, it works. Protest works. It puts pressure on, but it's not stopping what's going on. What we need to do is put pressure on this place. This is the city. This is the city of London. This is where most of the money is coming from that goes to the grouse shooting fraternity. It isn't necessarily going in the form of subsidies, although the government helps them with subsidies. This is companies going on corporate junkets. And it's, it's seen as a, you know, a little bit of a, you know, a positive thing to be asked to go on a grouse shoot because it seems like you're stepping up the ladder and it's a kind of like boosting of your ego, your status, all that kind of stuff. They spend, Millions and millions of pounds every year going to shoot grouse. The people who run the city of London in terms of the banking sector particularly. And we have to protest about this because they aren't everybody. They're a tiny percentage of us and we live allegedly in a democracy. And more of us want to protect our environment than those who do not have any regard for it. And we gather together and we have protested who came on the People's Walk for Wildlife just before lockdown a few years ago. I certainly did. And Yola Williams was there and Chris Packham was there and Bella Lack was there and many other people were there. And there's another one. And it was due to be 
in just a few days time on the 27th of November, but guess what? There's a strike. <laughs> there's, a, there's a rail strike because people aren't getting paid enough. And so there's a rail strike. So they've postponed it to the spring now, but we still should be going, which is great for me because I'm going away, which means I will be able to go in the springtime. So that's fine. So I can protest. Anybody who went on the last one will know that it was actually a joyous occasion to walk for wildlife. We had tens of thousands of people there. And do you know what we were playing? We sent an app out and we downloaded the app and it was the music of bird song from all 10,000 people walking along. It was an amazing experience. It was very uplifting. This is a protest with spirit and hope. So please do think about joining because that was us and that could be you. Okay, feel, feel the joy, feel the power that comes from protest. And some of you are saying, oh, I don't, I don't like protesting. Well, yeah. Well, if we don't protest, I'm afraid nothing's going to change very much. And here's the thing about protest. Protest is no good if nobody notices, if you don't inconvenience people, if people don't get a bit irritated, because that means you've made no impact. But we've changed the law so that if I offend somebody by making a bit of noise, I might get arrested. Something's very odd in this world at the moment. Hopefully things will change. But I think we can all agree on this. Canned hunting, if you know what canned hunting is? This is where people pay tens of thousands of dollars or pounds or whatever to go and shoot stuff, to kill them. I don't understand it. I really don't understand it. Somebody, you'll remember this guy because he was in the news, Walter Palmer. He was a dentist, you know, a dentist that went to Africa to shoot a lion. But it's not only people like that, you know. So David Scully, sports of countryside lions. He went to Africa to shoot a lion. Hand lion hunting. So when you go to, to Africa or wherever on these safaris, make sure you're not going to these kind of lion hunting sites or whatever it is. But we have it in the country here. The most common form of hunting in the UK is shooting pheasants. Yeah. I'm not saying you shouldn't shoot pheasants or whatever. I'm not saying that. But do you know how many pheasants we, we put into the UK every year? 40 to 45 million, even 50 million. They're not native to the UK. They're eating all kinds of things, including grass snakes and all sorts of other stuff themselves. They constitute the largest physical component in our countryside, a non-native species, which we've introduced. Oh, which, by the way, we've released quite recently millions of them again during the, during the bird flu pandemic. When all the chicken owners and all the turkey owners had to bring their birds inside, and yet somehow they were able to release all these birds into the countryside. Very strange, that. And as a consequence of that, buzzards get killed. And organisations that are supposed to be there to protect our wildlife, people like DEFRA, and Natural England, actually compensate the license. They actually, you know, they actually think about allowing the licensing of the destruction of nests of buzzards, and the killing of buzzards, next to release pens for pheasants. Or, or on, it's just absolutely crazy. We've lost complete perspective. A non-native species is getting protected whilst our native species are being eradicated. It just makes no sense. And it brings me to a very pertinent question because in my lifetime, I've seen some shockers for Environment Secretary, but we've had some perlers in the last decade or so. Uh, and, and I've been wondering, who's been the worst Secretary of State for the Environment in the last decade or so? because there have been some spectacular ones. Owen Patterson, we all remember him. He nearly crashed the Tory party, didn't he? Because poor old Boris, he decided he's going to have to change the rules to keep Patterson in the government. <laughs> and that failed. Well, he started it because he had that thing about badges. You know that? Remember badges? Yeah, he didn't like badges. Liz Truss. I won't have a bad word said against her. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. How can somebody go into a department and cut it by 25% without even understanding it? How can we end up with people going into a department of government who have no understanding of it, no experience of it, they're there for weeks, months, and then they go to another portfolio. And it don't matter if it's environment or whether it's housing or whether it's... You and I, right, we've got to be specialists or experts or at least have some knowledge to do a job. 
How many people in government, and it's not, I'm just talking about the Tories, I'm talking about the Labour, well, how many people in government move from job to job to job to job and they've got no clue about it? It takes you about three years to get a handle on a job, to really feel confident, to understand how it works. Oh, I wish we had specialists in specialist positions, it would be really good. Anyway, things are happening because of these kinds of people. I should have gone back to this one slide actually, because we recently had a person called Ranul Jayawardena. Do you know who that is? Never heard of him. He was the Environment Secretary for about five weeks, four weeks. But this person, in a space of five weeks, changed the culture in his department so that his department, the Secretary for the State for the Environment, all it was then geared to was growth, not to protecting the environment. If protecting the environment got in the way of growth, you put it to one side. So he has got to be the worst, I think. But hey, by the by. Anyway, go back to the buzzer just for a second. Should buzzers be killed to protect pheasants? Do we think that? No. No, of course not. Uh, so, again, you have to make your voices heard. So if the RSPB and the National Trust and the Wildlife Trust get so irked that they start to protest, and let me tell you now, RSPB are not a protest organisation. Right? They're not. They do not go up against governments. They try to work with governments. You know something has gone drastically wrong when RSPB, the National Trust, and the Wildlife Trust jointly tell you that there is an attack on nature underway. And that's where we were just a matter of a few weeks ago. And the jury is out, to use somebody's particular phrase, as to whether that has Change. We are in a cusp moment. We could swing either way in terms of what we do with our natural environment. Let's come to badges just for a moment. This is how TB is kind of spread. You can see it's mainly in the southwest. And badges got the blame for that. But here's a true story. You've got farms in the centre of the epicentre of where bovine TB is. And you've got cattle farms that have never had a single case of TB on their land in any of their cattle and they've got badges on their land. If they're right in the middle, in the epicenter, how can it be that they've not had any <coughs> bovine TB in their cattle? What are they doing differently? Straightforward. When they find this, these little pockets where they're not, they're called closed herds. Have you heard of closed herds? Because most herds are not closed herds. Cattle get moved all over the country. All over the country. From farm to farm to farm to farm to farm. And suddenly bovine TB pops up here and pops up there. Um, Owen Patterson actually said... You blame the badgers for moving the goalposts when the data didn't support his <laughs> what he was saying. The badgers are moving the goalposts, he said. But then, how does he explain this? An outbreak of bovine TB being confirmed on the Isle of Skye. What doesn't live on the Isle of Skye? There were no badgers. How did it get there? And it's simply... The movement of uh, cattle from place to place to place. That is a primary cause of bovine TB, TB spread. Simple as that. Um, so it worries me when governments start to call for the buzzards and badgers and cormants and all these kind of things being called. Because it means that they've got people at the top of the tree who are making decisions, making decisions not based on science, not based on facts, but based out of their antipathy towards a particular animal in certain cases, or a lobby group, a very powerful lobby group from a small number of cabal, small cabal of people, able to influence government policy against the will of the greater populace. So cormorants are definitely on the list. And here's the weird thing, we don't even know enough about cormorants to decide whether they should be called or not, because actually it turns out there's more, probably more than one species involved, because this one is our regular one that you see along the coast, and this one is a one called Sinensis, which is the continental cormorant, and it doesn't breed in the same places. Ours breed 
uh, sometimes in trees, but particularly they breed out on the coastal areas. This one breeds in things like reed beds and will go in trees as well. And if you go to the reservoirs, which gate reservoir and places like that, where they've got cormorants breeding, you will be able to see the two different forms of cormorant. This is the European form. Ours may even be a separate species. So all those cormorants might not be one, they might be two. Who knows? The data will be up. But it's not just that, is it? It's the fact that some people in very high power or very prominent positions are prepared to use the most devilish and outright lies. There's no other word for it. Outright lies. And they will uh, denigrate an organization like the RSPB because they fear the RSPB. Because the RSPB are the purveyors of science and facts that, that put a, a dent in their argument. So you had a thing called You Forgot the Birds. Has anybody heard of You Forgot the Birds? If you, anybody has ever read the Daily Mail or Telegraph or something, like, you'll have come across You Forgot the Birds because people who own those papers have wanted that publicized within their papers. And the reason is, of course, it's about the shooting industry uh, primarily. So You Forgot the Birds was an organization formed from a few uh, individuals from corporate organizations, and their sole purpose was to trash the RSPB. That was their entire remit. It was printed by Ian Botham. Right? Took a whole load of rubbish. They made all kinds of false allegations against the RSPB. Uh, and they were backed up by people like Songbird Survival, another uh, grouping that has uh, the shooting lobby at its, at its uh, core. And the RSPB... Credit to them, went to the Charities Commission and complained about the slurs, the slander, the libel that you forgot the birds made about them. Uh, and the Charities Commission found entirely in the RSPB's favour. I'll tell you how bad it was. They said that the RSPB had mismanaged its pension fund. Okay, to the point where it was in danger of collapsing. Well, and we remember 2008. <laughs> and Lehman Brothers, and then what happened in 2000, and then, you know, the, the, the catastrophic collapse uh, of financial situations around the world. At that moment, pretty much every charity based organization with a pension fund ended up with a deficit because of the very same people who were funding You Forgot the Birds, who were gambling with that money and lost. And so their allegation was could go straight back to those same people who were funding uh, these complaints. So, yeah, do not ever listen to You Forgot the Birds. They are a fake organisation. And it, it saddens me because he was one of my heroes. He was one of my heroes. Uh, and he's forgotten he's actually just an ex-cricketer. Um, anybody ever see a pigeon with a ring on its leg? People come to me, racing pigeons. Oh, I found this pigeon. Can I get it back to the owner? And you look, it's got a ring on the leg, and you think, oh, right, okay. And I usually say, I wouldn't bother. And they go, oh, why? Well, because they got a stamp on. And, if, and, and for most people, I'm not saying everybody, but most people who, who have racing pigeons, a lost racing pigeon is no good to them. Because it's not been successful. <laughs> so it's got a stamp on its wing. And you go, oh, yeah, that's right. So you take it back, you go, Got your pigeon for you. Thanks very much, they say, and you walk away. I wonder what happens to that pigeon. <laughs> it certainly isn't the peregrine that's killed it. Although peregrines, of course, do eat pigeons. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, we shouldn't be persecuting something because it's eating the thing that we keep chucking into the sky for our fun. You know, it's, this is a natural predator. In fact, it's one of the most awesome predators on the planet. Anyway, by the by, there's things you can do, you know. I'll come to some of the positive stuff, shall I? Yeah. Have you heard of record? Yeah? Or you, or you might have heard of, um, you know, the biobank and other places like that. When you go out and you see something, record it, doesn't matter if it's a plant, whether it's an insect, whether it's a bird, whether it's a mammal, make a record of it. Send the record in. 
Because if you do that, those records go into a, an archive resource, which can then be accessed to work out whether an area like this is more valuable as wildlife habitat or as a, an industrial estate. And this industrial estate here is down on the, near the Manchester Canal, on the, near the Mersey Estuary, a place that was called Halton Moss. Now, Halton Moss, right, was allowed to be developed because they said there was nothing of value there. But that wasn't true. It's just that nobody put the records in. So when they called for the records, and there was just like one spider that was notable, they went, oh, yeah, you can develop this. When it was actually amazingly full of diverse wildlife, everything from water voles to all kinds of breeding birds, including lesser spotted woodpecker, um, all kinds of invertebrates. It's an immensely successful area for invertebrates, or was. It's obviously much more damaged, but there is a little tiny nature reserve in there called um, Oxmoor Local Nature Reserve. This is near Runcorn. And, and so make sure you put your records in because you might be the person that puts the records in that means that a place is valuable. That means that, that when the records are searched for by when the new plan you know, the five-year plans and the, the development plans that local authorities put together. They go, oh, actually, no, this is a really biodiverse area. We need to protect this area. Instead of looking at it and going, there's no records from here. We can develop it. So you can make a difference in that regard. How about rewilding? Anybody know about rewilding? Some of you may have seen it in action. Anybody been to NEP? Anybody thought about going to NEP? NEP is right down in the southwest, sorry, southeast rather, uh, West Sussex. And um, this is an area of farmland where the estate owners decided to let it go back to nature. But to go back to nature in a sort of wildlife managed way. So they, but they, they're trying to make it profitable and they're certainly making it profitable because there's loads of people going to see what's there. This place is full of turtle doves. It's absolutely full of nightingales. It's an amazing place to go. It's full of water. It's full. What you got? It's got cattle there. It's got it's got um, pigs there. Tamworth pigs. It's got um, deer and all that kind of stuff as well. And now they're starting because it's got no natural predators, so it can't be true rewilding. You need natural predators in there. So what they need to do is they they have to cull some of the cows and some of the pigs and stuff like that, and then they sell the meat from that. So there is productivity off their land, but most of the money is coming from people visiting going, wow, isn't this amazing? There's a lot of money to be made from conservation, from nature conservation. Your conservation pound is very valuable. There are more of, you, more of us than them. Always remember that. There's more of us than them. How do we feel about beavers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course we feel good about beavers. They're a native species. Took us a long time. Does anybody remember the Napdale Project? Yeah, the Napdale project. Years and years and years they were doing the Napdale, Napdale project. They couldn't make their mind up whether to release them or not. Somebody just looked into the fence a bit, I think. And out they came into the Tay. And before they knew it, there was a hundred odd territories on the Tay. And then the fishermen were up in arms and the farmers were up in arms. And the fishermen were saying, they're going to destroy the fishery. Absolute nonsense. I sound a bit like Billy Collingly then, didn't I? Sorry about that. <laughs> um, nonsense it is. I was on the Eric looking at this dam where the beavers have built their, their lodge alongside the European be beaver doesn't build it across it, it's a long. And I'm looking in the centre of the river where all the trout and the salmon are, the big trout and salmon, where were all the par, where were all the fry? They were in the lodge, escaping the predatory big fish. The beavers were increasing the number of fish in the area, not reducing it as the, the fishermen were trying to kill it. Absolute nonsense. How about red deer? How do we feel about red deer? Do we think there's too many of them? Has anybody ever been to the Findhorn Valley? Have you seen it? It's like a carpet. Only where a tree can grow in Findhorn Valley is to put a big fence around it. Because otherwise, the deer browse it out. I, but you go to Finland, sometimes you can see thousands of red deer. I go to Scotland. This is how deer move in Scotland. <laughs> and that's all you hear. Chomp, 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 chomp. This is a deer in Spain. Spain. 
<laughs> they move a lot and they're always wary. Why? Because there are predators. Big predators. It could be lynx. Or it might be a bobcat in North America. But, but you know, where, where the big predators are, the browsers, the grazers, don't destroy the habitat entirely. They can't. They can't afford to just chomp away. And that's why apex predators, like the wolf, are so important. They are the cornerstone of biodiversity. They are a keystone species. If we truly want to rewild in the UK, we have to face the thought logically with science, with facts. Can we reintroduce the wolf? When they reintroduce them to Yellowstone, wolves completely transformed Yellowstone. Transformed it in the way that you may not ever anticipate. The number of bears increased. You go, how can that be? Well, when the Yellowstone wolves went in, they moved the deer and all the other prey animals that they were browsing and grazing around. And as a consequence, the browse recovered. The number of berries that were produced on those trees shot through the roof, as did the number of insects that were feeding on them. And the bears feast on those berries when they fatten up in the winter. And more of them started to survive the harsh winters. Now, I know we don't have particularly harsh winters, but you go somewhere like Findor and you see the impact of too many deer in a given area not being predated. And we don't do a good enough job of actually controlling the numbers in a natural way. We go for the stags, don't we? Trophy, stag. What gives birth? The stag, you only need one stag. I'm sure I've, lots of ladies here say, yeah, you need one stag. <laughs> right, so here's the thing. People worry about wolves because they think they're going to be attacked, all right? 2021 study of fatal dog attacks in Europe showed that the um, United Kingdom came to like fourth in the worst case scenario. We had 56 fatalities from dogs, right? Do you know how many people have been attacked by wolves? And there's lots of wolves in various parts of Europe. How many people have been attacked by wolves this last century? In fact, you go back into the 20th century as well. There's one record in Europe, and not even that is very provable. I think, you know, so wolves don't attack people because they're scared of people. They really don't. Um, we're more worried about wolves, and yet there are just no evidence that wolves predate humans. All right? It might happen very, very, very occasionally. But, you know, every time I drive on the motorway, I think it's going to be my last day. So there's lots of threats out there. Uh, this is a joke. <laughs> I don't know if you read it. The dog's holding the side of that. He said, that farmer saying, that dog's worrying my sheep again. He said, do not trust the humans, they will eat you. <laughs> bears. Could we reintroduce bears into the UK? Could we do that? Who would be comfortable with that? Put your hands up if you're comfortable with that. You see, there's not even, even the people who are really, really, really committed to nature conservation struggle with the idea that we could be introduced bears. There are bears in Spain. Do you go to Spain? Have you been to the Put your hands up to the Picos de Europa. Right, do you get eaten by a bear? There are bears there. There are enough. It only takes one bear. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. We are scared to reintroduce our native wildlife. Bears were here a few hundred years ago. Bears were here 400 years ago. Bears were here. Wolves were here less time ago than that. If we truly want to rewild, we have to do this. Well, there's plenty of other things we could do in the meantime. You know, the way we farm our land, we actually, I don't know if, I mean, I'm, this is not against hill sheep farmers, all right? But here's a for instance. You can't make money from putting sheep on a hill without being subsidized. Did you know that? You cannot make money in the UK from a hill farm with sheep without a subsidy. 
And the subsidy is very substantial. And these are some figures from, uh, from the Welsh Government. £53,000 is the average hill farm sheep subsidy. £33,000 average hill sheep farm income. So you can see that the average farm hill farm loss is £20,000. All right. So does it make sense to keep throwing that money into that? Or should we do something different? Because if we don't, this is what happens. Because when the sheep get up in the upland areas and eat all the, the shrubbery in the browse, the water runs off like nobody's business. We're going to have, they're predicting we're going to have big, big rain again in February. And you go, how do they know that? Well, we've got La Nina going on at the moment and it usually means big rain in February. This could be the scene in the UK again this coming February. But if you have a well-developed natural environment with lots of trees and shrubs up on those hills, it slows the water down substantially. So it reduces the flooding, which costs how much? Billions, billions of pounds from excess flooding because we've denuded the hills. So logic says we need to stop doing that. Irrespective, even financially, it says we need to stop doing that. Uh, but we need to find better ways. The world is, is burning, uh, as we know at the moment. But um, we never really face the big elephant in the room. We're a bit scared of it. We don't talk about it. Uh, we've got to deal with the root cause of global warming. Okay, let's talk about sustainability. Uh, let's talk about clean energy, sustainable agriculture, carbon footprint. Actually, how about we talk about the human population? We just hit a billion. A billion. We can't keep doing that. Where are we going? How many people do we need on the planet? All right. But we're not going to talk about how we deal with that, are we? Because we don't talk about it. Well, this is a co another cartoon. Planet Earth. Six billion, seven, now eight billion. And off voice says, with regard to be fruitful and multiply, cancel that order. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, you know, we live on a finite planet. We live on a finite planet. We already use all the resources that we can produce in a year by August. So for the next three and a half, four months, we're in debt. We're using our reserves. How many years can you do that for before ecosystems collapse? Not long. We have 12 years before we hit 1.5 or less. Increasing problems from that. That's going to cause wars. I'm not joking. It's going to cause wars. Why is it going to cause wars? Because when ice caps melt, Huge areas of land become unlivable. They flood. So people have to move. When people move, people become protectionist in terms of their borders. And that's how wars start. So we have to think long term. But there's things we can still do. In the meantime, before the revolution, we can protest in a small way. We can go to Hen Harrier Day. RSPB members across the country do it all the time. Go to a hen harrier day, make your voice heard. And if you think it doesn't make a difference, I'm going to prove to you that it does. And I'm going to prove to you that it does from right here. Do you recognize this? Yeah. Okay. The kinder trespass. Look at those people. Well, I'm going to rephrase that. Look at those kids. Look at those kids. A lot of those people were jailed. They were jailed for protesting their right to, to roam. We still don't have right to roam in the UK. Well, we're not alive. We have it in Scotland. We don't have it in England. Can you believe that? They have it in Scotland. We don't have it in England. Amazing what we'll put up with. But they changed things, didn't they? The Ramblers Association kind of grew out of that. And you can ramble all over the place. Who goes rambling? Blimey, O'Reilly! Oh, you must really irritate the other ramblers because you keep noticing birds and slowing everything down. So, <laughs> and botanists are even worse. But yeah, 
So I'm going to finish with this, and I'm welcome to take any number of questions, but um, you think you're powerless. You feel powerless after this talk because you can see how much is going wrong and how much damage is being done. But the power is in our hands. As a collective, we are strong. We are powerful. We are as powerful as any politician, any government, because we vote them in. And if you don't vote for the ones that are causing the destruction, but vote for the ones that are actually prepared to do something positive, you're already making a contribution. And don't forget all the little small things you can do. The shade grown coffee, the Poland line tuna. Or you can go and join a protest and make your voice heard. Or go to the local garden centre and say, when I'm putting my flowers in, I want no poisons, pesticides on my plant. Simple as that. There are things you can do always. Just need to go out and do them. And so do I. Thank you, folks. A few questions <coughs> with quick answers. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. I thought those uh, pesticides they were Nearly cottonoids, never easy to say. I thought they were uh, banned in the EU. I mean, since we left the EU, yeah. Britain, yeah, we did. Uh, and it's, it's in the balance at the moment because uh, the farmers were saying that they were struggling with certain crops, mainly beet was the, was the thing. But, you know, it's the thin end of the wedge. Once you allow one thing to happen, then it tumbles and other things start to happen as well. So, um, they, had a, they felt they had a particular case and the government decided that they did have a case and they allowed them to start using the neonics again on beet crops. Um, but that means that then there's a precedent set and precedence is always a problem because then it's people use precedence as a, as a reason for something else to happen as well. Um, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully it'll swing back the other way very shortly. Won't be banned three specific chemicals anyway. Yeah. But it, it's, it's, so it's it, about a few it's, tens of thousands. Yeah, of it's, it's that the fact that the you know we, the, when we came out, it did allow that change to happen. So anyway, next, go ahead. Hi. Hello. Um, you mentioned I think the Citizen Science mm. Project record. Um, I, I wonder how much of that Yeah, there's, I mean, there are, I mean, the RSPB runs it, the biggest citizen science project of the lot. You know, how many of you participate in, in the annual, um, garden bird survey? You know, in the, in, yeah, fantastic. You know, I mean, that's not all of you. Um, but you could spread that word. Oh, that's, that's fantastic citizen science. Go ahead. No, I, I, this is what I'm saying is there are so many organized bug life I can point to. Uh, obviously BTO, uh, even the local wildlife trusts are heavily involved in doing citizen science type projects. There are any number of them out there. If you're interested, you can find them. You know, it's like, it's, it's, uh, and I know not everybody in here is comfortable using the internet. I realize that, but you can find somebody that is, uh, and they can point you in the right direction. There are so many and they do such valuable Work. I'll tell you one citizen science project that I always sticks in my mind. I have a problem with slugs and snails in the garden. And it's, it's mainly because I've not got hedgehogs. And I need to make sure that all the neighbours are putting accesses into, their, into their, their fences and things so we can reconnect habitats so the hedgehogs can come in and control my slugs and snails. But I do remember this piece of science where this lady was matching how far snails could home she was taking the snails, marking them, moving them away, and recording them coming back. I just can't throw them far enough. I was like, oh, don't do that, don't do that. Just, they, just, they can come like 100 meters or something back. I mean, goodness me. Didn't, who knew I had homing snails? But anyway, that's by the by. Do you not think there's a problem in that there are so many groups who have a concern about nature that if only we could all get on big <coughs> umbrella, umbrella yeah. 
with all the groups. I love that question. Did you hear that question? Are there too many groups campaigning individual strands? That's possibly true. But here's what I'm going to say, and it's going to sound really controversial. We are the worst people for internal warfare. One group fighting, you know, we're all in the same side and we end up arguing with each other. And the opposition love that because a divided team can't win. We have to go, okay, we're not getting everything we want as a community with each other, but we're all on the same team heading in the same general direction. We need to stop fighting with each other because we do all the time. One group will, will the groups will form and then one group will say, we're, we're leaving that group because we disagree with this bit of what they want. And then they start to bad mouth each other and, and the opposition, they love that. And you'll notice the language in papers. I'm not going to mention the papers. You know which ones I mean. They use language to divide us. They put one group of people against another group of people. They are very subtle, clever use of language for people who are unsuspecting about what's going on. To me, it's blindingly obvious, but it's not blindingly obvious to most people. And they get conditioned, and my dad gets conditioned by it. So I constantly end up in a difficult conversation with my dad when I try to show him that the evidence just doesn't support his argument. Um, but basically, you've got to watch out for the people who are trying to divide you because they're trying to divide you because they're scared of you. They're genuinely scared of the RSPB, the power that it holds. They're scared of the wildlife trusts and the national trust. Because if, a, if we come together, if we speak with one voice, they have to listen. And they have to change. Them. So what they do, they'll put paper, newspaper stories out, bad mouthing certain elements, uh, suggesting that we're actually you know, you, they use phrases like anti-woke, you know, and uh, it, it, it's a false narrative that they're putting out there and it's designed to divide. It's That's what its purpose is. And we have to remember that we are being conditioned and they're trying to divide us. And we as a community need to remember to speak. We don't have to speak with one voice. We need to speak with eight, nine million voices but we see, need to sing the same song, and we do it. We need a communal hymn sheet. We need a communal hymn sheet. Why don't you write it and we'll sing it? <laughs> okay. Right then, I think, I think we have to come to a halt.